Happy Memorial Day. I do hope that uh, in, in the middle of all the barbecues and celebrations and visiting and all the things that go on over the weekend, I do hope that you will be mindful of those who have served and sacrificed uh, for our nation. I'd like to make one thing clear, uh, get it started this morning. This woman that I'm sitting with over here is, in fact, my wife. <laughs> Making a, a rare visit up from Richmond. And uh, so we've had some family things going on up in this area. Well, Ohio, but that's kind of this area. When you live in Virginia, Ohio seems really close to Pennsylvania. OK, so that's how that works. Um, so, as we turn to the word of the Lord this morning, would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the life that we have in Christ, all that that means to us, not just here, but in the, the life to come. Uh, we're turning to your word, Father, this word that is, in fact, life-giving. So, I ask for your blessing on our time, this investment that we make in your word that you are making in our lives. Speak to us, teach us, train us, inspire us that we might be uh, the people you've called us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, we're continuing in our series, Foundational Acts. This is part two. And today the sermon title and the subject is spiritual leadership. Uh, I guess I've come to understand over the years, whether it's a spiritual enterprise or some other enterprise, you rarely does an organization of any kind go any further than its leadership has gone. So leadership is extremely, extremely important. We're going to see how uh, the leadership in the early church began to organize and how the leadership in the early church began to function. Uh, now, true biblical leadership in our day should organize and function in much the same way. And I think that is the case, uh, uh, certainly within our denomination, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, as well as uh, any other church that might claim to be evangelical. Uh, this short passage of scripture this morning would be very foundational to how leadership is organized and how leadership functions. Now, the early church was expanding. It was developing. And as per the instructions of Jesus, these first disciples were bearing witness in Jerusalem. And that witness was going to spread to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Of course, uh, it wouldn't be those original 12 disciples that would do all of that. Uh, it would be carried out through others who came to faith, first of all, through their witness, and then, of course, in later years to come, through the witness as it spread throughout the world. Now, you might recall a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were looking at a series called Simon Says... One of the things that was said had to do with speaking this word. And it came to us from Acts 4, beginning with verse 15. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, speaking of the lame man who was healed. But in order that they may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name, the name of Jesus. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak of these things. Now, in a, a chapter later, we see a summary of all of that speaking, all of that witnessing that was taking place 
through these early disciples. And there's a summary statement that comes in one verse, chapter 5, verse 42, and it says this. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so we can find that the claim that Peter and John made that day uh, before the council, we can't help but talk about this. Well, that continues and continues and continues day by day by day in the temple, house to house, speaking of what they have seen and heard in this man, Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, when we come to today's text, which comes from Acts chapter 6, well, it's like this. There's some good news and there's some bad news. Now, the good news is that there are more people. People are coming to Christ. More and more people are responding to this message that is going out through the early disciples. Good news, more people. Now, here's the bad news. More people. You get how that works? With more people, what happens? Well, more problems. Have you ever noticed that people have problems? People cause problems. More people, more problems. Okay, that kind of goes hand in hand. So as we come to chapter 6 of, of uh, the book of Acts, we find that there is a problem that has surfaced. So let's read this text. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The word of the Lord. So, in setting the stage, here's what we find with verse 1. As the number increased, a complaint arose. Cause and effect. This is just the natural outcome of people being people and being together. A complaint has arisen. Now, what kind of complaint? Well, there is an immediate issue, and then there's a larger issue. The immediate issue is that the Hellenist widows are being neglected in the distribution of food. Now, if there's one thing we know about the church, you don't mess with people and their food. If the food was to stop, I'm not so sure the Christian faith wouldn't just crash and burn. Okay, so you're messing with the food. Now, we're going to get into this Hellenist Hebrews thing in just a moment. So stay tuned for that. The Hellenist widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. Now, here's the larger issue. Hellenist on one side, Hebrews on the other. And so what we have here is a case of discrimination. This is much bigger than who's getting fed, albeit being fed is a big deal. But the larger picture really has to do with discrimination. Now, let's think about this for a moment. Is there anything in Scripture that suggests that the people of God should take care of their widows? I think there's a little bit, okay? 
Let's go way back, all the way to Moses, to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. It says this, For the Lord your God is God of God and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Now, let's move much deeper in time uh, into the book of James. Chapter 1, verse 27, it says this. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. In other words, the word of God from beginning to end tells us take care of people that are at a disadvantage. Take care of the people that are among you. Make sure that all of my family is well provided for. In spe and specifically, those who are widows. And yet, in the early weeks and months of the Christian church, what's happened? Widows are being overlooked. So already, we've got trouble. Now, the immediate issue, don't mess with people and their food. Take care of these ladies. But the larger issue is an issue of discrimination. The Hellenist versus the Hebrews. Okay, so what is the distinction between the Hellenist and the Hebrew? Well, the Hebrews refers to those who see themselves as more authentically being the people of God. These are authentic Hebrews who continue to live a Hebrew life and speak in the Hebrew language. Hellenists were those who were a little more late to the party. Uh, folks that perhaps are Jewish, uh, perhaps are uh, practicing Judaism, but now that they have become part of the family of God through Christ, they're now Christians, but they live in a Greek world, a Gentile world. They use the Greek language. So one of the clear distinctives between the Hellenists and the Hebrews is that the Hellenists are more blended in with the world at large and are speaking Greek as their natural language while the Hebrews are holding more to the traditions of the Old Testament, even though they've come into faith in Jesus Christ. So we've got two groups of people, both of whom profess to follow Christ, but there are these petty differences. And those differences are flaring up in that the Hebrews are looking at these Hellenists as, let's say, outsiders. So we've got this classic tension between those who are the insiders and those who are the outsiders. And the outsiders, in this case, are being overlooked. So what happens? Well, quite, quite naturally, uh, this, this problem is brought to the attention of the disciples who are the Let's call them the de facto session of that particular body. These are functioning like elders would function. They are holding a spiritual oversight of this group. There's a problem, and so this problem is brought to them. Now, when I think of this situation in real time, I'm thinking, well, you know, there's certainly biblical precedent for taking care of the widows. So when this is brought to the attention of the apostles, one might think that the proper response would be to drop everything and make sure that these widows are being taken care of. But that's not what happens. Okay, we go to verse 2. It says this, The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples, and they said, uh, it's not right that 
that we should give up preaching and teach uh, the word of God to serve tables. To serve tables. It seems like an almost flippant remark on the surface. What do you mean, serve tables? Aren't you supposed to take care of the widows? Yes. But we're also supposed to take care of the word of God. So we've got a a question of priority. Now, what we're dealing with here is a group of people that have brought this to the attention of the apostles with the expectation that the apostles are going to take care of this. They're going to fix this problem and they're going to fix it right now. Which begs the question, what is the function of the senior church community leadership? Now, we're going to look at that in a couple of ways today. This is part one of that. What should we be doing? Well, according to verse two, what they should be doing is preaching the word. What should they not be doing? Well, they should not be serving tables. Okay, it's a matter of priority. It's not that feeding these uh, Hellenist widows is not important, but it's a matter of priority. Uh, The distinction is an immediate issue and a larger issue. Now, the disciples know that these ladies need to be fed. They also know that they've got to maintain their focus on preaching the word of God. What to do? Well, this is one of those times where it's helpful uh, to take a look at the original language. Uh, The original language of the New Testament is Greek, but it's not modern Greek. It's what's called Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, for those of you who are taking copious notes. Okay, Koine Greek. So, when you read this verse in Koine Greek, the verb to serve is the word diakoneo. Transliterated, it's D-I-A-K-O-N-E-O. You know, one kind of strange thing is when you see an O at the end of the word, or a W is the way it's expressed in Greek, you pretty much know this is a verb form in the infinitive to serve. But when you read it in Greek, what it says is this. It says to deacon. Diakoneo is the word from which we get the English words deacon and diaconate. So what are we saying here? Well, to serve is to deacon. Is that starting to connect some dots for you? Okay, where is this going? You, know, you can see where it's going. So what is the function of the serving church community leadership? Well, their function is to serve. And we come to verse 3, and it says this. Therefore, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So, we're forming what might be thought of as the very first ministry team. The apostles are going to maintain their focus on the preaching of the word. But they're going to raise up this ministry team that's going to serve the needs that are going unmet. Now, how does this work? Well, pick out from among you seven men. What are their qualifications? One, good repute. Two, full of the spirit. Three, full of wisdom. Shouldn't be too hard to find people like that, right? So these seven folks are introduced. These deacons were to be selected by the group at large and then appointed by the apostles. I hope you're beginning to see the parallels to how we are organized and function here in the church today. Now, I want to take a little side trip. I just looked at the clock. You know, it's really tricky when you change times. 
I have till quarter to 12, right? <laughs> Isn't that how this works? Okay. I want to take a little side trip for a moment into looking at the qualifications for a deacon. Now understand that when this incident was taking place, these qualifications had yet to be articulated. It's going to come later, but I think it's important to us to understand some distinctions here. Uh, so we go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. It says this, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. There's one really cryptic line in this list of qualifications. This verse 9 says this, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. The mystery of the faith. What, what is Paul talking about? Well, let's go over to another letter from Paul to the Colossians. Chapter 1, beginning with verse 24. Now, Paul, I've mentioned this before. Paul is the master of the run-on sentence. He doesn't use sentences. He just uses paragraphs. They go on endlessly. So you kind of have to read a lot when you're dealing with Paul. Uh, more than I really need. But grammar demands that I read all of these verses. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, what is the mystery that Paul is referring to? The mystery is that Jesus Christ came to save more than just the chosen nation of Israel. He came to save all who would believe, Jew and Gentile. The mystery that was hidden for the ages is that the gospel is for everyone. It is inclusive. It's open to all who would receive the message of Christ and respond to it, including the Gentiles. Now, why is that listed as a qualification for deacon? That you hold to this mystery with a clear conscience. And what has that got to do with feeding Hellenist widows? I mean, the Bible to me is so fascinating the way all these dots line up and start to connect. You see, what this teaching is telling us is that these Hellenist widows are not second-class citizens. They are fraternizing perhaps more with the Gentile community than the authentic Hebrews are, but that's not an issue for God because the mystery is that the gospel's for everyone. Hebrew, Hellenist, Gentile. We're all invited to the throne room of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But apparently this, this issue was so significant that it's reiterated. 
again and again and again in scripture. I can only assume that's because it continues to pop up again and again and again as a problem. Which is why I say that, yes, there was the immediate issue that the Hellenistic widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food. But the larger issue was the issue of discrimination. Discrimination against those who were not purely Hebrew. But those barriers have been broken down. And as we, in our day, think about who should we invite to the throne room of God, the answer is everyone. Everyone. That's how we end up in Revelation with that multitude that's too numerous to count from every tribe, every language, every nation, every people. Why? How does that happen? Because the gospel is for everyone. And here we are in the first months of the Christian church, and they're already fighting this fight. Interesting. Human nature being what it is. Wow. So what is the function of the senior leadership of the church? If it's not, quote, to serve, how then should the senior leadership be spending its time? And so we go to verse 4 of Acts 6, and it says this, We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Prayer and the ministry of the word, which reminds us, of course, uh, earlier in Acts 2.42, what were the folks devoted to? The apostles teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Well, in order for the apostles to teach properly, they have to be people of prayer. They have to be people of the word. So not only are they preaching and teaching, but they're studying they're committed to knowing the word of the Lord. You might recall that we talked about Ezra a few weeks ago. Ezra 7.10. Ezra was devoted to three things. One, the study of the word of the Lord. Two, living out the word of the Lord. Three, teaching the word of the Lord. You see, Ezra was doing the very things that now these apostles need to be doing. And the senior leadership of the church is a spiritual leadership. That's how they serve. Whereas the deacon level of the church is more taking care of this need, that need, other needs as they arrive. So devotion to two things, prayer, ministry of the word. Prayer, the source of power, the source of discernment, guidance, illumination, uh, preaching the word, the ministry of the word, teaching and applying the word. Now, I have a personal paradigm that I'd like to share with you when it comes to Bible study. Uh, whatever comes up in life, whatever the issue is, the Bible responds to that issue. And so there are several things that, that I run through in my own mind. First of all, what does God say about this in his word? Secondly, what does God mean by what he says about this in his word? And thirdly, what does what God says and means mean to me? What is it that I should learn from this? What is it that I should do because of this? And I find that to be a very simple but helpful paradigm in studying the word. What does God say? What does God mean? What do I do about it? Very simple approach. So here's what we're finding in this passage of scripture. We've got directives here for the senior level leadership that would be equivalent, say, to our elders in our day, the work of the session. And then we have directives here for the serving level of leadership, which would be the deacons in our day and how they are to go about the business of their particular ministry. So who was on that first slate of deacons? Well, we've got Stephen, 
who has a man of much renown that we'll speak of in a moment. And then we have these others, uh, these six other names. And I want you to notice that many of these names appear to be Greek names, which I think is very relevant to the moment. It seems that some care was taken to make sure that those who received this, this task of taking care of the Grecian widows, the Hellenistic widows, were in fact part of that Hellenist group who were being singled out for this particular role. Now, Stephen, you might know him better from chapter 7 in Acts. Stephen arguably the first deacon, was also the first Christian martyr. Now, I don't mean that to discourage any of you from serving, from serving as deacons, okay? But I do think it's interesting. Now, if you ever want to see a comprehensive yet succinct history of God's relationship with his people up to this time, read chapter 7, the testimony of Stephen. And for his trouble, we find that Stephen is stoned. He is executed. Interestingly, it's at the stoning of Stephen that we first meet the apostle Paul who was still operating by his Hebrew name in those days, Saul. And so in Acts 7, verse 58, we read this. They cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, we see this. And Saul approved of his execution. So we're now introduced to the Apostles Paul, Apostle Paul. Now, how do senior leaders empower serving leaders? Which brings us to verse 6. They set them before the Apostles, and the Apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. There is a service of commissioning which we continue to this very day as these deacons are commissioned by these elders to serve in the way that they are going to serve. Now, what was the outcome of how the apostles and how that early Christian community handled this particular moment? Brings us to our final verse, verse 7. The word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And great many priests became obedient to the faith. Now, I want you to speculate with me for a moment. Consider this. What do you think would have happened if the response of the apostles to this moment had been remorse, panic over the fact that these women had been overlooked. They drop everything and divert their attention away from prayer and the ministry of the word, the preaching of the word, to take care of this need, setting the precedent that says, anytime you have a need, come to us and we'll take care of it. I'm thinking verse 7 would read something like this. Uh, the word of God failed to increase. No one came to faith. And there'd be no mention of priest. Now, obviously, that's not what happened. But you, you see where I'm going with this? You know, when God lays out priorities, different ways of serving him, they all have to be present. They're all important. And when the church functions the way that God designed it to function, the body of Christ increases. The kingdom of God grows. 
And we get closer and closer and closer to that multitude that we will see in the throne room of God at the very end. Part of the foundational acts of the early church was the foundation of leadership. Spiritual leadership that the twelve provided and the serving leadership that people like Stephen and these other men that were appointed to that role provided for the community. Now here in our day at NPC, there's all types of leaders serving in different ways. We have elders and deacons and staff and care group leaders and team leaders. We have Sunday school teachers. We have volunteers of all sorts, some heading up ministry teams. All of this traces its roots back to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 that we've looked at this morning. Now, if we were to tie this to our mission statement, it would look like this. This is how we connect. This is how we connect as the people of God under roof here at North Park Church. And as we connect properly, as we connect biblically, we worship God passionately and we impact our world in word and deed. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for making it so clear how it is that senior leaders lead, serving leaders serve. All of us worship, connect, and impact. We thank you for your guidance, your direction, your inspiration. And we ask, Father, again, that we would always grow into being the people that you have called us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen.